uh, professor of statistics at Stanford University. You're a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. And in research that you conducted and two others posted on April 8th, you concluded that, quote, based on the data until April 4 for the whole COVID-19 fatality season to date, the risk of dying from the coronavirus for a person 65 years old is equivalent to the risk of dying driving a distance of 9 to 415 miles by car per day. Now, I have been saying, and then I look at your research, that the numbers that were thrown around early on, models that were not really made available, data which I didn't comprehend, and maybe it's because it wasn't very solid, these huge numbers of millions of Americans were going to die, then hundreds of thousands of Americans were going to die. I could never find the real basis for these, these, these numbers. And the media kept pushing them, and they had charts on their, on, their, on, the, on their monitors and on their screens every day, every day, every day. Then I read your piece. It says, wait a minute. We don't have reliable data. Tell me what was in your mind when you wrote this piece, and tell me why you were right. Thank you for the very kind invitation, Mark, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to try to answer these tough questions. Um, I'm a person who's working with data, and I'm also trained in infectious diseases, so it was uh, natural that uh, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, uh, evolved, uh, it, it became a top priority for me to understand what was going on. And uh, much like many other scientists, I started looking at uh, what information do we have available and how solid is that evidence that is guiding decisions that have monumental impact on uh, saving lives uh, and uh, also potentially harming lives uh, because of the consequences of some of the measures. It became very obvious to me that uh, the evidence that we had in the early phases of the pandemic uh, was utterly unreliable. Uh, we had to base our decisions uh, on whatever we had and I think that uh, we did the right thing to act decisively and urgently. However, many of the numbers that were circulating were based on how many patients we were seeing with symptoms uh, who got tested and then how many of those died. It was possible that there was just uh, a tip of the iceberg, that many more people could have been infected and actually uh, these uh, they're never documented because they were never tested, so the denominator might have been much larger. The original figures that were circulating uh, and the ones that were circulated by WHO suggested that 3.4% of those people who we diagnose, we give them a label of uh, COVID-19, uh, would die. And uh, of course, this is astronomical risk of death. And early mathematical models built on these assumptions, uh, uh, or a little bit toned down assumptions, but still making astronomical predictions about uh, tens of millions of people dying around the world, 50 million people, 2.5 million people in the U.S., which of, of course would be a catastrophe that we had never witnessed before. However, that's not true. It is completely off. It is just an astronomical error. And over the last several weeks, we have started accumulating data that show that uh, indeed there is an iceberg and we were just seeing the tip of the iceberg. There's far more people who are infected with this virus. The vast majority of them don't even re re realize that they have been infected. They are asymptomatic, they have no symptoms, or they have very mild symptoms that they would not even bother to do anything about. The best data that we have now suggests that it's not one out of 30, or one out of a hundred people who get infected who will die, it's probably in the range of one in a thousand. And we also know that there are some types of people who are at much higher risk than others. Most of the population has minimal risk. It's in, in the range of uh, dying while you're driving from home to work and back. However, very elderly individuals, people who have severe underlying diseases, in the hospital in particular, or in nursing homes, there, there are settings and people who are at very high risk. And these settings and these people we need to protect fiercely and do the best and save lives. However, the original expectation that we'd, we'd be seeing tens of millions of dying individuals, that's not happening. Now, I'm not a mathematician. I'm a constitutional lawyer, and there's a big gap between the two. Um, you say one in a thousand. You're saying well under one percent. Is that one tenth of one percent of the, of the of the population that actually has the virus uh, will pass away 
as a result of the virus or in connection to the virus? So this is also an open question because uh, uh, for the data that we have a little bit more mature and detailed information like Italy that has already gone through the peak of uh, their uh, epidemic wave, we realize that 99% of people who die with uh, this virus have other reasons as well to die. Uh, on average, they have close to three other reasons to die. Uh, on average, uh, they are 80 years old with other comorbidities, as we say, and uh, there's quite some debate on whether these people would have died anyhow, uh, if not immediately, you know, perhaps in a few days or a few weeks or, or a few months. In our country, we see a fairly similar picture. We see that uh, people who are disadvantaged, poor people, uh, uh, creating even further inequality in the population through COVID-19 seem to be uh, very hardly hit. We see that the uh, age at death on average is a little bit lower compared to European countries uh, in the range of uh, 73 or 74 years old. And we see again lots of comorbidities uh, in people who die with COVID-19. It's very hard to say how many of these people would have died anyhow and how much is the direct contribution of the virus. Uh, these data are evolving. But if anything, they suggest that the burden of disease, as we call it, the number of person years lost, how many years of life are being lost, is much less than even what the number of deaths would suggest. This is not to minimize the problem. It is a serious problem and we need to deal with it and we need to protect these vulnerable individuals who are actually among those that our society probably uh, has not helped in the past. So we need to do everything to protect them. But in the big picture, the risk is much, much, much lower compared to what we thought before. I think you and a handful of other experts, Dr. Katz of Yale and so forth, and your team uh, have developed a growing uh, consensus, I think, among experts and certainly among the people. Take care of the vulnerable, but let the rest of us go free. That we have lives to live. We'll be careful. We can mitigate, we'll figure this out, but we have 22 million people now who are unemployed. 22 million. God knows what it's going to be next week and the week after that. And we have some politicians saying we're not going to open up our economies in our states until we have a vaccine, or we're not going to open up the economies in our states until every single case is resolved. I want to turn back to you when we come back, not about the politics, but is that even rational? We'll be right back.